the big question oops, the big question of course will be how much more than an hour do we go this year the over under is 98 minutes <laughs> no no we're going to do a lot better than that i know you've all heard that before but it's true this time for, like uh bullwinkle moose used to say this time for sure all right welcome to the presentation on winter birding on the mendocino coast i'm tim bray and of course david jensen you all know and this opening slide, by the way, it was taken on a Fort Bragg Christmas bird count. This was the freezing morning. This was the, it was about, I think, 29 degrees or something when this photo was taken, but it sure was a spectacular sunrise. So this will be the 11th Fort Bragg Christmas count, uh, but we got a long way to go to catch up with Manchester. They've been doing it down there for 47 consecutive years which is really quite remarkable. This is a map of the Fort Bragg circle. As you all probably know, the Christmas counts are restricted to circles of uh, 15 mile diameter, seven and a half mile radius. And so there's the circle for Fort Bragg. It runs roughly from just south of Big River. Uh, Chapman Point is just barely in the circle and it runs up and the north boundary is pretty much exactly coincides with Little Valley Road. There's the Manchester Circle, or it's drawn as a circle here, but really the Manchester is more of an oval. <laughs> but that's pretty close. Runs basically from Elk to Point Arena. And again, that's going to be Saturday the 2nd of January and the Fort Bragg count is coming up on Monday the 27th of December. Seven. The calendar was kind of cruel to us this year. <laughs> we didn't get a good, we didn't really have a good choice of dates. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. There we go. All right. So first quiz. Oh, before we get to the quizzes, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, warn you all. I don't think we really got the word out in advance because David and I were still working on this presentation pretty late in the game, but we're doing it differently this year. It's going to be a quiz, a series of quizzes. Uh, instead of us trying to teach you all how to identify every bird in the circle in the next hour and a half, we're going to see how much you already know and then that'll help direct you to the tutorial videos that I will talk more about in a couple of slides. But I want to start off with a quiz right off the bat just to get you in the swing of things. And uh, it's also bo both a quiz and a drinking game. So if you could line up your favorite drinks in front of you and take a drink every time you get a bird wrong, then uh, we'll all have a lot of fun. So here's the first quiz. This is an actual unretouched screenshot from the 2019, from December 2019. So the quiz question is, which day was the 2019 Fort Bragg Christmas bird count on? <laughs> the 29th. <laughs> and for extra credit, which day was the Manchester Christmas count? And uh, so this is kind of a pattern Although I think that was probably the most extreme example. We had basically 10 days of balmy weather with one day of rain on Christmas count. But the uh, Manchester count consistently gets better weather than the Fort Bragg count. So we will see. That's because we're further south. Oh, yeah, of course. Duh. So if, it's, uh, if the weather is terrible, as it always is on the Fort Bragg count, uh, then you have the choice of staying inside and birding through your windows. And last year, we really made a big deal out of this. And I think we're going to do that again this year and uh, really get as many people involved in feeder and, and yard watching as possible because it's an easier way to participate. And uh, you can just look out your window and follow the, there are some strict protocols for how you count birds in your yard or at a feeder. And to get those, get a hold of Johanna Jensen uh, and her email is up here on the screen. 
or go to our website, mendocinocoastaudubon.org, and you can download the information, the instructions, and the checklist. But if you want to go out in the field and you need to brush up on your birding ID skills, last year David and I created a whole series of videos, tutorial videos on the winter birds of the Mendocino Coast. And that's why we're not going to try to go through all of them again tonight is because we already did that and it's all on our YouTube channel. So we have a whole series of these winter birding tutorials. And if you just go to YouTube and search for Mendocino Audubon and then look for the birding tutorials playlist, uh, you've got hours and hours of entertainment there, including last David, year's. I, go ahead, David. If I could interrupt for just one second. Um, for those of you who are sparrow specialists, um, I want to acknowledge the fact that um, I understand there's uh, one mistake, at least one mistake, one mistake that I under, that I know of in the tutorial on um, the sparrows and finches. And in that tutorial, I say that um, in the winter, our summer sparrows go south and the northern sparrows come down to spend the winter. And since then, I've learned that is incorrect. We have a population, our local breeding population are the Nuttles, Nuttles white crown sparrows. And they are un a bit unique. In, they're the only group of white crowns that don't migrate. They are here year round. But it is true that in the winter, we get the Pugetensis subspecies coming down from British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon. So I was half right. The, the white crowns from north come down for the winter, but our resident nettles just stay here all the time. So uh, I say that because um, it's it takes so long to, to make a correction to these videos that I probably never will. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's super hard to do actually. All right. Uh, those are actually, we tried to make those pretty useful. A lot of them are nice and short and digestible. And I think they, uh, some, we've heard a lot of good feedback that they really help people. So we'll refer back to them throughout the presentation tonight. All right. Now let's go to the next slide, which, why am I not getting the next slide? What happened there? There we go. All righty. Quiz number one. So we're going to arrange our quizzes by habitat uh, because a big part of identifying birds is just knowing what to expect where you are. So it isn't really fair to ask a quiz about a bird without telling you where you are and what kind of habitat you're in. So this slide just shows the habitat we're going to start out with, which is the kind of edge habitat around the developed areas and at the edges of the forest you got maybe an orchard in here you got some brush patches you got some open grassland so it's multiple different kinds of habitat converging on these edges and that's usually where all the bird action is so we've got a whole bunch of birds in this kind of habitat we're only going to quiz you about a few of them and we're going to start with a pretty easy one <laughs> especially since david was just talking about them so the big question here is not so much which species of bird this is, but you also have to count them because this is, in fact, the Christmas bird count. So everybody take a, uh, take a guess at how many birds are sitting on the fence here and write your, quest, your number down. I'll give you a little bit to ponder it, and then we'll just go ahead and give you the answer. So everybody got that these are white crown sparrows, right? And even the ones that have brown stripes are juvenile white crown, they're first year white crown sparrows. They haven't reached maturity yet. David, do you want to hazard a guess as to which subspecies this is, or does that matter? Yeah, this is, yeah no, this is a great view of the Nuttles, uh, Nuttles white crown sparrows, our uh, year round resident white crowns. Good. And I believe that my count was 18. Uh, but 
we will accept any number between 15 and 20 as the correct answer. That's one of the great things about counting these birds is you don't have to be right. You just have to be pretty close. Be sure you check the I am not a robot box. <laughs> okay, so here's the other really common sparrow on the coast. And the first thing you notice, of course, when you look at this is the clear chest and it's kind of grayish. And then the next thing you might notice is that little gold wash on the forehead and the dull bill. It's not bright yellow like those birds before. So this, of course, is the golden crown sparrow. Now let's get harder. I actually had to do a little jiggery pokery with this slide, as you can kind of tell, uh, to get these birds a little closer together. And we, we don't really have the perfect shot because these birds, these sparrows like to scatter themselves out when they're feeding like this. And so I kind of crammed them up a little closer. So we got six sparrows here. How many species? What do you think, David? I think there's two. So we got our golden crown sparrows, these big bulky kind of smoky, they're kind of gray looking birds with these real dark streaks on the back. I can, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, oh yeah. So we zoom in a little on these birds down here and compare them. This is a golden crown sparrow, even though you can't see his golden crown, you can see that he doesn't have the striped head that all those white crowns had. And he's got this dark back and these dark stripes. And then this is a young, white crown. He's got this yellow bill, which is a dead giveaway for a white crown sparrow. All right. Here's an easy one, right? See how we're doing in chat here. Okay, everybody. Yep, everybody's getting these guys. Very good. All righty. So this is an easy one. And the first thing you can tell basically is the habitat it's in. Look at those little dinky twigs that most woodpeckers wouldn't bother with. That's where you find the downy woodpecker. So I, I liked this picture because you can't really see the bill, which is usually most of the guidebooks will tell you to look at the bill length to identify downy versus hairy woodpeckers. And a lot of times they don't let you look at that. And uh, you can still tell in many cases uh, because of where you are. This twiggy habitat is really characteristic of downy woodpeckers. Let's zoom in a little bit if I can and have a look at Rogers. Look under the tail feathers. You can actually just see the little black spots on the under tail. And in some views, that is the best clue you're gonna have for a downy woodpecker because Harry's have clear white under tail feathers. Okay. <laughs> this is an unusually good clear view of this bird because they're almost always on the other side of the trunk when you're trying to see them. And you edge around one way and they edge around the other way and you find yourself re realizing that you're stuck in a Saturday morning cartoon and you're trying to identify Bugs Bunny. But this of course is the very oddly named red-breasted sapsucker, or as Chris calls them, the red-headed sap sipper. Everybody understand those birds? And these, th this is a perfect fit with that opening slide I showed you with the habitat because they, they just love orchards. And in this area, this is the only woodpecker that's gonna have a red head. I mean, completely red head. Others will have red areas, but this bird is red across the whole back of the head. Only yep. one. Good call. The back of the head is really a distinctive ID on these birds. Okay, Can now I ask we're gonna quick Oh, sure. And I was curious because um, this is Sue Coulter. I had one, um, you know, work on a young tree out front. Do they damage? Are they damaging in what they do? Or because I notice a lot of things benefit from eating what they do, like 
I saw hummingbirds, I saw acorn woodpeckers, I saw butterflies, I saw squirrel, but I didn't know if it did any damage to the tree. So I was just curious if you knew that. Yeah, they actually can. Uh, some trees don't, some trees withstand it better than others. Uh, they, they just love fruit trees and they will drill so many holes in a fruit tree that it lets in a lot of disease and the tree spends a lot of its energy trying to repair the damage. So it takes, uh, it saps vigor out of a, an orchard tree sometimes. Most of them just kind of deal with it and go on. Well, um, there are some trees though that are more susceptible to wound, uh, wound damage and infections. Like I noticed that uh, the California Ceanothus, uh, which sapsuckers rarely work on and it's a good thing because the Ceanothus does not like having its bark damaged and it frequently will kill the tree within about a year uh, if a sapsucker work, starts working on it. But a lot of other trees, it doesn't seem to bother them very much. Those banksias, for example, that they love so much in the cemetery, uh, they're more holes than bark at this point and doesn't seem to slow them down any. Awesome. All right, how about this bird? This is, this, this is a tricky little bird. This view of it is hard to tell what you're looking at here. Uh, yeah. Some of you have probably already figured it out. Let's see if we got a better view. Eight-throat sparrow. Yeah, how about that? That view gives the game away right there. So the white-throated sparrow has not only this brilliant white throat, but these two yellow headlights. Very distinctive. Other than that, you could be forgiven for mistaking them for a white crown sparrow. They closely resemble them. These are much less common, but in recent years, we've had quite a few of them in Fort Bragg. David, do you get these down in Manchester? Um, yes, but less often than in Fort Bragg. Yeah. They're kind They're of a town bird. Bragg. They're kind of a town bird in some ways, aren't they? Exactly. I think that's that's the difference. If if I was going to look for them in in the Manchester count, I'd look at uh, Irish Beach, in the village of Irish Beach. And we found one once up in Elk, but they're, they're less common there. They're beautiful birds, though. Okay, here's a <laughs> a tricky view uh, of a tricky little bird. This is actually a fairly common bird in the winter here, and commonly found in gardens and around the edges of orchards and open spaces, skulking around in the brush, and they frequently only show you this view. So what would you guess this bird is? I'll give you a moment to ponder it and take a look at the overall brown color, uh, what you can see of its bill, and most especially that rusty tail. And if it hops around and gives you a look from the front, that's what it looks like from the front. So those of you who said this was a hermit thrush, uh, you don't even have to drink. Or maybe maybe we should have set this drinking game up the other way around so you drink every time <laughs> you go to the fight. <laughs> Everybody got the hermit thrush? You know this bird? Of course you do. Again, go ahead. Uh, bird biology, this is a bird that's here in the summer and the winter. They, in the summer, you can hear them sing just above the pygmy. Um, but those birds that are uh, in your yard this winter will actually migrate up to uh, southern British Columbia, uh, to British Columbia and southern Alaska to breed. And um, hermit thrushes from Central America will migrate up to our area to breed in the summer. So it's not a it's not a horizontal migration; it's a vertical migration. All right, here's another classic view. How many times have you been looking in a bush and you see a bird and you can only see parts and bits of the bird? So that's often what you've got to work with. But there's enough here to identify this bird beyond any doubt. And it's one of our, again, a common winter bird 
especially in gardens and around edges and edge habitat, normally found on the ground or within two or three feet of the ground. They very rarely fly very high up into a tree. And uh, this is one of the two birds that we have that kicks in the duff with both feet extremely vigorously. So what do you see? You see a colored bill on an all dark brown bird with these big triangular marks on its chest and a big eye ring. And that's a classic look at a fox sparrow. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit more time on this slide because you get to stare at it for a while just to see the birds. This is a great one from Roger. And first, how many how many birds you got, and then how many species have you got? Let's see. We got... So there's five sparrows in this picture, and there are five species of sparrows. So from left to right, we have the dark-eyed junco. The white crowned sparrow attempting to hide behind a twig. Our little buddy, the white crowned sparrow. White throated. Or sorry, the white throated sparrow. Thank you. This one is the tan striped variety, just like white crowned sparrows. They, they come in both white crowned and tan crowned. There's our buddy, the golden crowned sparrow, which all you can really see is this plain gray face. Most of our other sparrows have got some kind of markings on their face and these golden crowns just have a plain gray face. And then our buddy from the last slide over here on the right, the fox sparrow. And then it doesn't want to, there we go. All right. <laughs> so, Tim, Tim, before we move on, let me just plug our, our videos again. For those of you who are going, I just don't think I'll ever get to know the sparrows please go and visit the tutorial and uh, we go through them pretty slow and, and have a little of some more photos and kind of some clues on how to break them down into different groups. So uh, don't get frustrated. It's all right. Yeah, exactly. That, and that's in all seriousness, that's part of the reason we're doing this as a quiz tonight is simply to let you figure out which things you really want to work on. And then uh, those videos, I think, will really help. And David made a very exhaustive uh, video about the, the sparrows. It's what, 45 minutes long, I think? Yeah, so, it's, it's a little long. But the great thing is you don't have to sit through it. You know, it's not like tonight. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a video and you can jump around and you can pick out which sparrow you really want to work on and kind of go at your own pace. So uh, I hope you'll go use those videos to reinforce your skills. All right, here's a <laughs> fun look at a bird that's very commonly found around the edges of open space here on the Mendocino coast, winter and summer. These are, these are year round residents. And uh, this one's a little bit funny looking. Uh, one, because you can't see its head and two, because it's a juvenile. It's an immature bird with immature plumage, which can be kind of cryptic. But I'm sure you all know what this bird is. And now you do. Yeah, don't worry. He, he didn't lose his head. So this is the, the immature red-shouldered hawk. And uh, they often have this funny, just got out of the shower kind of look to their hair, their head, you know, with the, their feathers sticking out. And this is a classic posture for them. They sit upright. They don't slouch as much as red tails, but they often seem to be staring right down between their toes, looking at prey right under the ground. But the main thing you look at here is the chest pattern. Uh, he's got an unmarked head, unlike the adults, which have some patterning on their head. But he's got this blotchy pattern on the chest and then a slightly different pattern blotchy pattern down on the belly. Uh, and that's unlike the red-tailed hawks that are much more common. And actually here on the, in the Fort Bragg circle, uh, red-shouldered and red-tailed are about equally common. We probably have 
we maybe have more red shoulders than we do red tails. And it's the other way around down in Manchester for sure. All right, that concludes the first quiz. How are you feeling about the quiz so far? Everybody uh, doing okay? Does <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> Exciting. All right, good, good. Well, then we will just keep on at it. We'll keep moving around through the quiz here. Uh, and this quiz number two is going to test your ear birding skills. So this slide, when you first put it up, you probably thought it was just habitat, but there is in fact a bird in there. Uh, and you can see it right in the center. And you can tell though what the habitat is, this dense brush that these guys hide in. Most of you probably know this bird, but when you're this close, you might hear the, this kind of a vocalization. Let's see if it will play for me now. What do you mean you can't play media? You could before. Whoop. Huh. There we go. So that's a kind of a funny little call, isn't it? You hear that a lot when you're real close to these birds. Uh, but the call that you hear more often from a distance is this one. Oh, it's, why are we, why are you being? Huh, that's very strange. Honest folks, we made this work in the practice. Yeah, and weirdly it just worked. There it goes. How come it plays when I go up and not down? <laughs> there we go. So that's the call everybody knows of the wren tit. And in fact, uh, if you're counting, there were two wren tits on that call. The male was the loud one. And if you had your sound up loud enough, you could hear the female in the distance calling back. Very, very common bird here on the coast. And the reason Tim knew that was a female was because it did not trill at the end. It just kept that steady cadence, like the beginning of the male's call. The females yep. don't do the brrrr at the end. Yep, they just do those evenly spaced whistles. All right, so we've got two wren tits on our checklist now. Let's find another common bird. These guys are everywhere. I could have probably put this into any of the habitat categories, uh, except maybe the open ocean. <laughs> I've never seen one out there, but everywhere else, uh, these little guys are bipping and bopping around. They never sit still like this photograph shows them. And let's see if we can get... <laughs> so weird yeah it is and even weirder oh something So there you go, there's that typewriter call. Uh, I always say that these little birds remind me of somebody typing with two fingers on an old IBM Selectric. And then every now and then a young birder looks at me and says, what's an IBM Selectric? But that call is uh, frequently heard and you can count these birds even if you don't see them just from that call because nothing else sounds quite like that. That of course is the ruby crowned kinglet if you happen to get a good view of one like this, you can see the little thin pointy bill, this giant eye ring, which does not extend all the way across the front like it does on a Hutton's Vireo, and most especially this black bar behind the white bar. They have a very striking wing pattern. Again, all of this is on a video. There's a, there are two birds on the coast that look almost identical, Hutton's Vireo and this ruby grand kinglet. You can tell them apart quite easily by sound and by several visual cues as well. And I made a special video 
uh, just to tell those two birds apart. Now you're going to play. Okay. Now you can't even see the bird. And this is kind of to make you understand that you can count birds whether you see them or not. And this bird is far more often heard than seen. And sometimes not even heard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Apparently I have to do a bunch of gymnastics now to get these sound files to play. Yeah, something is really strange here. Okay, do you hear that? The infamous Vireo sneer. Almost like a cat snarling at you. That is the Hutton's Vireo, a little gray bird that kind of tends to perch, sit still, and then move from one point to another methodically working through territory, very much unlike the sort of random flitting around that the ruby crown kinglet does. Hutton's Vireo, everybody got those birds? They're, uh, I think they're undercounted because they're not seen very often yeah. uh, and because a lot of people don't know that call. Yeah. There you go. All right, let's see if I can get to my next one. Okay. Probably not going to play again, are you? No, you're not. This is very strange. Now, what are you doing? Okay, anyway, while I flail around, you can look at the habitat. Uh, which this is some of my favorite habitat to bird in, these tangled, messy fence rows and bramble patches with the Himalayan and California blackberry and all kinds of brush. You can see a little water in the background. This is terrific habitat for a lot of birds. And what I've got here is a bird that we don't usually get on the, on the Fort Bragg count, but we do get on Manchester count. So that angry little call, scolding call, uh, kind of a metallic sound. Sometimes they sound almost like an electronic device or something. And uh, you very frequently can't even see the bird. It's down inside all this brush and, and tangled mess, uh, busily messing about. But it'll make that call and alert you to its presence. And that is the call of the Buick's Wren. Oh. If you get to see them, that tail and that bright eye line really give the game away for Buick's wrens. Now, again, in Fort Bragg circle, they're quite rare, actually. Uh, we, in most years, we don't get any, and sometimes we'll just get one or two. If I could interject here, there, it, it, it's an interesting thing about these wrens and, and the, the genus is Troglodytes, uh, Troglodyte caveman. There's another wren that we do get in the Fort Bragg count that again, you have a hard time seeing and that's the, the Pacific wren, it used to be the winter wren. Again, that's a bird you're gonna hear 10 times more often than you'll ever see. So what is it about these wrens? I don't know, but uh, these two in particular are very secretive. My theory is that they're delicious and so they have to stay hidden all the time. They're so, I guess that's, they're small like a potato chips. So you got to eat a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, I would think sharp shinned hawks probably just really love those guys. We actually, yeah, we have three species that we regularly get. Uh, the Buicks here is the rarest in, in Fort Bragg. And then Pacific wrens, which you find in cold, damp places. Uh, if you're looking at a giant wad of sword ferns, you're probably hearing a Pacific wren. And then, uh, in the marshes and wetlands, we get marsh wrens. And again, far more often heard than seen. You'll stand in a marsh and you can hear five or six of them hollering away at each other and then good luck trying to find one. 
All right, everybody got the Buicks ran? Go find me one. I, I'd really like to get this bird on the Fort Bragg count, uh, but we often don't. Find those bramble patches. That is their, the two places that I think I've seen them the most on the coast are in uh, blackberry patches and most of all in uh, thickets of old roses. Down at Elk, there's a place where there used to be a bunch of houses, but they're all gone. And all that's left are the these big bramble patches of wild rose where people planted roses in front of their house. And the house is gone, but the rose remains. And those things are impenetrable. Uh, and these Buick's wrens just absolutely love them. All right, how many birds? <laughs> Count them quick. No, you can't do a one, two, three, four. These are birds in flight. This is our next quiz is birds in flight, uh, which are always a big challenge. So we're kind of stepping our game up here. So these are, first of all, what are they? Uh, they're black, so they could be blackbirds. But look at the wing shape. Those, as David calls them, delta wings. Uh, and that big bill sticking out in front, you can see even in the in flight. Uh, these are starlings, European starlings, and there are 27 of them. It's important to note that two dozen, 24, 27, it's all the same. When yeah. you're, it's all the same. Yep. You don't, you just do the best you can and move on. Yep, yep. Any answer between 20 and 40 is correct here. On the other hand, sometimes you get a chance to just count birds. So here we have a manageable number of birds. There's the two on the right that really catch your attention. And then there's two more on the left. And I'll just go ahead and give you the clue that these are all the same species. And the thing I want to point out on these guys is these are one of the two birds on the coast in winter with a bright yellow underside. There's only two species to choose from. So that makes it easy. And these with the black heads are lesser goldfinches, which used to be kind of scarce here on the Mendocino coast. And in, several years ago, we just started noticing them more and more frequently. And now I think they are at least as abundant as American goldfinches, which kind of around the same time started becoming harder and harder to find. Is that the case down south too, David? Pretty much, yeah, yeah, pretty much. You, As you move further inland, you get a lot more of these lessers. Now you get a lot more Americans too, but when I was living in Ukiah, uh, lessers were quite common over there for me. Yeah, yeah. I think of them as an inland bird, and yeah. uh, they've really moved into the coast, though. Yeah. Uh, frequently found wherever you find thistles. If you can see it, if you're uh, on the edge of a field and there's some old dead bull thistles with the heads blown apart, these guys and the other goldfinch just love those things. So what you look for on lessers, the, the males, like I said, the males stay bright yellow all year round and very much unlike the American goldfinch. And the females are uh, a little more, it's, it's harder to tell female Americans from female lesser goldfinches. So if you don't see males, you got a tougher job. We have a good chance to see these uh, on the uh, road around the Sutter Buttes when we go to the Central Valley. Oh yeah. They like it a little bit drier than the other birds. Okay, here's the other one. So you can see right away, uh, look at the chest on these birds. Uh, these are not all females. These are a mixture of males and females. And in the wintertime, they lose that brilliant yellow color. But they have, they get kind of brownish and they have these really bold, buffy wing bars. Much more prominent, I think, than on lesser goldfinches. These are American goldfinches. Uh, or greater goldfinches, as Chris calls them, because if you got lessers, you must have graders, right? And the other clue is the white undertail. 
on American goldfinches. Lessers are yellow all the way under. That's a little harder to see a lot of times because these birds move around a lot. And how many? Everybody get a count? There's a dozen of them. And these are all American goldfinches. Now these guys, <laughs> these guys, and once again, it does not want Tim, the, the Tim, the re, there you go. The recurring theme seems to be you move to the next slide, then come back and it works. Yep. That little upslurred sneer at the end really gives a, gives these guys away. And everybody identify these birds. Uh, they have come back. These are pine siskins. David's favorite bird. <laughs> uh, for the record, um, I've taken down uh, in the last newsletter, I, I, I wrote about feeders in the backyard and uh, thistle feeders for the lesser goldfinch and the American goldfinch. I've taken down my thistle feeders uh, because these guys have returned. The siskins have returned. The reason I took the, the feeders down, the, the thistle feeders, these guys get sick so easily uh, and they fly into windows so regularly that um, I don't want them around my house. I don't want to deal with picking up dead or dying pine siskins. They can go feed themselves silly on catkins and when the catkins are gone, they can move on to uh, Sonoma County. But uh, I've taken down my thistle feeders for the winter. Yeah, they they can range very widely. They're an eruptive species. And last year was a major eruption year for pine siskins, as we'll see in the next couple of slides. Right. Uh, but they will move hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles uh, in the wintertime traveling around to find food. So don't worry about you know, you don't have to feed them. They are fully capable of moving around the country and finding food. And you can get them in large numbers. So here's a backyard <laughs> shot. And this isn't the whole flock. Uh, hmm. But you can get enormous numbers. So everybody take a guess. There's no way you're going to sit there and count these birds uh, either on the slide or especially in the field because they're just moving around all the time. So you have to be able to just look at a big wad of birds and come up with a guess. And I'm going to make a bet. I'll bet you a drink that you undercount. Your guess is too low. And then the second thing is uh, when you're going through looking at a flock of birds and trying to count them, that forces you to look closely and you realize, wait a minute, some of these are not like the others. So there's there's actually two species of birds in this slide. So I'll give you a little bit of time to stare at it and see what I'm talking about uh, before I go on and show you how I counted them <laughs> and we'll come up with a number. Hi. Diane, can you mute your... Uh... Oh, sorry. Yeah. No worries. All right, let's let's uh, let's go to the next slide and I'll show you how I counted them. So I just put this on my program and painted a little circle on each one of the pine siskins and my count was 80. So what was your count? When I looked at the slide and guessed, I was guessing about 40. So I was about half. Oh, somebody guessed. Yeah, we had some good guesses yeah. in there. 80. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah, that's that's your first reaction. 80. Sign her up. Yeah. I want her on my territory. Yeah, good counters. Excellent. Uh, and then the other species that I've circled here um, are the six American goldfinches that are sneaking in there with <laughs> siskins. Uh, tricky to identify. But again, if you go back to that slide we had, you see these big buffy wing bars showing up and they're just kind of a drab olive green color, unlike those brilliant yellow male American uh, lesser goldfinches. So 
There's your 80 Siskins and six Americans. And like I say, you can get really huge numbers of these things. Here's a photograph that was taken on the Manchester count last year. Remember I mentioned that we had a, a real eruption year with Pine Siskins. So Ryan Kiefer uh, snapped this photo and then gave it to his dad who counted them up. So take a guess. You're, obviously you can't count these, <laughs> but take a guess at how many birds are in this flock. And then I'll show you how Bob counted them. So here's, <laughs> Bob printed the, printed the photo out and then sat down and drew lines around groups of a hundred at a time. And using that method, you can see his total there, 1,946 pine siskins. Uh, I, would, I would accept any answer between 1,500 and 2,500 uh, and give full credit for it. By any measure, that is a lot of pine siskins. We had some good guesses. 1,350 is a good guess. 1,200, yeah, look at you guys. Yeah, those are good guesses. Yeah, loving it. Loving it. You guys are good. We're going to make the quiz harder next year. <laughs> you can do it. Yeah. Is, nobody's getting drunk yet. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can get off of the Siskins. Here we go. Yeah, let's go back to something easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Shannon. <laughs> easy and uh, unusual because this is a bird that is normally found in huge numbers. And <laughs> so I found a slide with only one in it. Oh yeah, how many Americans? I don't know. There could have been American goldfinches in the pine siskins. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the butter butt, but you can't see his butt. How do you know it's a butter butt? Uh, yeah, yellow throat, yellow shoulders. The shoulders are really the this little yellow patch on the right in front of the wing is a big giveaway. These are super common birds. In fact, they're uh, typically one of the two most abundant birds on the Fort Bragg circle. It's usually a toss up between these guys and American Robins. We count around a thousand of them in the Fort Bragg circle and I'm fairly certain that's an undercount. Boy, for some reason, there we go. All right, a few slides ago, you remember I mentioned that there were two birds with a bright yellow underside on the coast in winter. This is the other one. And uh, you might think this is tricky because he's partially obscured by foliage, but this is an unusually open place for one of these birds to be seen. These guys skulk around a lot. Okay, you guys are all still on the last one. Okay, let's just start looking at what we can see. We can see, first of all, bright yellow belly underneath and kind of yellowish green overall. And look at the bill. It's not a sparrow. It's not a goldfinch. It's got this little warbler bill. It's got yellow underneath the tail over here. It does not have any wing bars, very plain wings. And it's got a kind of a little dark line going through its eye. And that is enough to identify the orange crowned warbler, uh, which is one of the, what do we have? Three common, three fairly regular warblers here in the coast. We have the, the uh, yellow rump that is super abundant. We have orange crowned warblers, which are not abundant. And we have Townsend's warblers, which are somewhere in between. I think in Fort Bragg, we typically get one or two orange crowns, maybe three or four on a good year uh, on the Christmas count. We'll get about a thousand yellow rumped warblers and yeah, maybe 20, 30 Townsend's. Note the, note the lack of striping on this bird. 
the back, the shoulders, the the flanks. There's no striping. Yeah. There's there there are very 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 few small birds in this area that you can say that about. This may well be the only one. Yeah, they're very plain. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I think for next year's quiz, I'll find a harder picture where you can't see that bright yellow belly because very often you can't. They're they're often down low in the cover and you can only see their back and then all you see is this olive greenish bird or what i call the little G, the lgyj the little greenish yellow jobs okay everybody got yellow, orange crown warblers if you don't once again go to the youtube review all that on the on the videos. Oh, I wish I had video for this bird. That's what I'm going to try to do next year. I'm going to get a video of this guy doing the wing display and I'm going to set it to music. I think maybe, you know, a hip hop dance tune or something. So this is a great garden bird. Uh, this is actually taken in my garden and another town bird. These guys are frequently found in Mendocino, in Fort Bragg. And I think we got more of them here than we do down in Manchester because they tend to like towns. Everybody know this bird? They are just a kind of a drab gray until they open those wings and show those brilliant white wing patches. Yep. And you, yep. you can, see, you can see those white wing patches when they fly too. That's a real helpful guide when they're in flight. Yeah, these are like Willet. You know, Willet is a shorebird that is the same way. They're just a drab gray bird. And then they open their wings and you just have to blink because all of a sudden they're just flashing these brilliant white wing panels at you. But they do that in flight and it's really distinctive. Northern Mockingbird, great bird. Okay, final bird for the gardens. <laughs> For the garden's habitat. These are very, very common birds in suburban gardens. Even in town, you'll find these guys right there in your backyard, especially if you have a bird feeder. And this is a fairly typical overhead view of one flying by. So what do you see? Long tail, short wings, very thick, round wings. And notice this crooked, patch it they got a bend in the wing at the wrist and its head barely sticks out doesn't stick out past the wings and then of course this long squared off tail now you see this white patch here and you might think hairier but you'd be wrong that is actually a sharp shinned hawk and the reason they come into your backyard is because you have a bird feeder out and they're eating the birds that are feeding on the feed Everybody get the sharp chin? Yeah, good. Wristy, sharpie, wristy. Sharpie, wristy. And yep, harrier. I, uh, like I said, you can be forgiven for mistaking that for a harrier, although you still have to drink. So whoever that was said, harrier, you got to drink. And the coop, nope, it's not a coop because coopers make a cross. And again, you, we used to go on and on about these guys in this presentation, and then we made a video about it. So. Go check out the video on YouTube and it will sort you out about Coopers and Sharpies. You know, Tim, if I can say, go back to that slide and just make a point. It's really important when you look up that you do right away without hesitation, look at that head uh, because this bird is gonna be gone in, in a half a second maybe yep. a second and a half, and you won't have the ability to go back and look to see if, if the head extended. So try to train yourself to look at that front of the wing head projection as soon as you pick up on the fact that there's a raptor up above. So many times I've cursed myself for not noticing. So yep. learn from my mistakes. <laughs> All right, so here's... Uh common garden birds again. And uh, I'll go ahead and give you a hint. These are not the same species. So 
They're both commonly found, as you can see, in the garden. This guy was taking over. He was going to help me dig out a bed. Uh, this is the bird we just saw in flight with these heavy dark streaks on the chest and these teeny weeny little stick like legs. And then this guy with the little delicate streaks on his chest. This is actually a Cooper sock. There's more clues in there, but we could spend 15 or 20 minutes trying to dissect that. And uh, we did all that in the YouTube video. Uh, so I would definitely say go look that up and work on your accipiter skills because you will see these birds. <laughs> and there's the video you're looking for. Before we leave it, this is a this is the splash, you know, the opening slide, but there's that cross shape on the bird on the left for the Coopers. Coopers make a cross and that wristy look of the sharp shin on the right. All righty. How's everybody doing? Anybody getting drunk yet? <laughs> okay, well, we're getting gonna... Whoop, whoop. Usually, they, usually they fall asleep from us droning on. I think tonight they're going to pass out. Uh, <laughs> I guess the end effect is about the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, stick with us. We're doing fine here. How are we doing for time? Oh, yeah. We got to move right along. Uh, imagine you are now looking at the forest at dawn. So it is still cold. It's just becoming light. Light's hitting the treetops, but it hasn't hit the forest floor yet. And you hear this eerie sound. Now, let us see if we can hear the sound. Yeah, once again, I got to do this weird thing. Huh. The next slide. Yeah, I'm trying to. There we go. Come on. My controls are being very strange. Actually, this is very odd. All right, here's the sound. Oh, now it's, come on. Doesn't even sound like a bird, does it? <laughs> okay, everybody want to guess at that bird? Yeah, yep. Love it, you're doing good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a ref's whistle. Yeah, that's varied thrush. A beautiful bird when you get a chance to see it. Uh, they tend to hide a lot, but they call a lot right at dawn, sometimes in the middle of the day, but most often right at dawn, and you'll hear it coming up out of the shadows. Now, let's see if it will play the other call that I have that you will hear. Notice that we have in the background some pine trees, and a general rule of thumb is on the coast, if you have a bunch of pine trees around, you probably hear these birds. This is so weird. It'll play one file, but not the other. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we already heard you. We want to hear you. Yes. those panicky little calls. I've heard people describe them as being like Morse code. To me, they just sound really panicky, like the oh my God bird. And uh, these are the birds that Chris calls short-tailed nuthatches. Short-tailed nuthatches. Uh, if you look them up in the books, they're called pygmy nuthatch. But they aren't really that much smaller than any other nuthatch. And so the real defining characteristic, if you see them fly, they look like somebody clipped their tails off. 
you know, you almost can't see their tails because they're so short. And they're very commonly found around these pine trees. All right, now let's see. We have two different birds in this slide as well. When you're in the conifer forest and you're looking at trees, and sometimes you can see movement, but you can't see the bird. See, going this way. Next slide. Yeah, I did that. Oh, sorry, I was distracted. So, some of you maybe can't even hear these birds because they're so <laughs> high pitched. They are really high-pitched calls and kind of reedy. And they're way high up in the canopy. So you just see these little bitty birds fluttering up underneath the branches. And those are, did we get guesses? Brown creeper's a good guess, but not quite. What we got here is golden crown kinglet. Now, when you hear golden crown kinglets or see them, uh, listen very carefully and look farther down the tree. The kinglets are way up in the canopy, but down lower on the same tree sometimes or in the same part of the woods will be this other bird that I also can't seem to play. There we go. You hear that? Trees, 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 trees. The two note, two clear notes is the brown creeper. That's the call of the brown creeper. And again, far more often heard than seen. I, I probably see brown creepers about one out of four times when I hear them. And golden crown kinglets, it's much less than that. And here's a bird you can actually see, but again, uh, they will alert you to their presence long before you see them. another eruptive bird. I don't know if we're going to get these birds this year or not. Uh, I haven't been hearing them lately, but some years we get lots of them. These are uh, the red-breasted nuthatch. And classic look at them, upside down, working in Douglas fir cones. Okay. I think we are mercifully past the the audio part of the quiz. <laughs> Back to the binos. Yeah. So now we're going to be in open country. We've gone from the conifer forest uh, and we're in open country, grassland, and uh, maybe out on the bluffs. And here's a great flight shot of a bird that is always difficult to photograph. And we have these regularly here. And has everybody identified this bird? These bright white outer tail feathers in flight really give them away. It's a medium sized bird with big chunky delta wings like a starling. And in fact, they often are found associating with starlings. Yeah, that's very, the meadow. Very, very long piercing bill too. It is Western Meadowlark. And they're, they can be a hard bird to find up here. You got a lot more fields down in Manchester, so you get a lot more of them. But there's only a few places up here where we find them in the grassland. Yeah, there's something about this, the way this is working, that's a little weird. So here's another open country bird. David, this one's much more in your territory than mine. 
Yeah, this is a very common bird down around the Manchester area in the cattle fields. Although that said, uh, last year, I haven't seen it yet this year, there was one uh, that st spent quite a bit of time uh, right behind in Fort Bragg, right behind the uh, fire station at the edge of the mill site. So they, they can be found in, in the Fort Bragg area. Yeah, exactly. We'll be looking for them on the mill site. And uh, surprisingly, they show up on the coat on the bluffs sometimes. Yeah. Yep. Virgin Creek. Of course, everything goes to Virgin Creek, I think. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's just because we have good birders that go there and find all these birds. But anywhere where there's open country, you might find one of these guys. A pretty little says Phoebe. They, uh, they've got that flycatcher shape with that salmon pink uh, underbelly. Really pretty little birds. Now, here is a really challenging slide. And the first thing to do is look at the habitat and you're in a marsh. These are reeds. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you can't hear this bird because that would kind of give it away. Or if, if its mate was singing, that's the clue I'll give you. This is a female bird. But this is if you, if you wind up having to take a drink after this one, don't feel bad because this this is a bird that stumps people a lot. So it's brownish and real streaky. It has some kind of indistinct wing bars, it has a long pointed bill. In this slide, it kind of, it's got its head tilted toward you. So it almost looks like a sparrow bill, but the bill is longer than that. And it has this prominent eye line uh, and it's in, the, it's in the reeds. David, uh, how many species did you guess before we converged on a answer to this bird? <laughs> Oh, I knew it right away, Tim. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, before we before we let you know what it is, this is a real important bird to, to learn because the sooner you learn to identify this bird at a quick glance, the less time you're going to spend in your field guide trying to figure out what in the world it is because you're going to cross paths with this bird every winter. Yeah, and summer. it throws people off a lot. It looks totally different from the male. This is a yeah. female red-winged blackbird. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, okay. These are tricky birds. A lot of people are taking a drink right now. Yeah, yeah the female red-winged blackbird is this brown streaky bird with that eye line that used to throw me off. Uh, like David said, I spent a lot of time pouring through my books, generally in completely the wrong part of the bird yeah. book, looking at the wrong species uh, before I figured these birds out. It does help that they usually are found in a flock. And so you can find the males first and then figure out the females. And if you know your blackbirds at all, you know that the uh, uh, female brewer's blackbird, like the male brewer, like the male red wing, neither of those three have pronounced striping on the back or on the flanks. This is the odd bird. Yeah. So. Okay, this is a counting exercise. Uh, you probably narrowed it down to some species of blackbird, but you don't know which one. And the sound would give it away if we could get the sound to play. Okay. Now we play? No, you still won't play. Huh. Huh. Weird. The is becoming increasingly cranky here. I think you're going to have to sue Zoom, Jim. Start drink play. Ah, yeah, I'm going to have to see a drink. Okay, now you got that bird right. These are the red winged blackbirds, the same species as the last slide. But the real question here was how many of them are there? That's the challenge. 
Okay, we have guesses here. Uh, <laughs> seriously? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 160, 250, 130, 170, 200, 160, 90. Those are pretty good guesses. They are. They're good yeah, you're guesses. all in. The, you're in the ballpark. Uh, I counted them by tens, and I got 156. So, I think pretty much everybody passes, gets a passing grade on that one. 90 might be a little low. You, you have to start getting more confident. <laughs> it, it, whoever gets 90 has to take a half a drink. <laughs> Hang in there, Barb. Hang in there, girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, the advantage of drinking when you get it wrong is that you know your counts will start to go up, and generally and you have an excuse. Yeah, yeah. We usually undercount. So, okay, more uh, more of these exciting slides of parking lot birds. The key question here is how many species and what are they? because these are definitely not all the same species and i will i will just freely admit that there is still some doubt uh, in my mind and that of the guy who gave me the slide this is a slide from roger and we still aren't really quite sure which species these two are we know what this guy is on the on the upper right and his compadre down here the big heavy bodied spangled birds with big long pointy bills those are the european starlings uh and we know what this guy is do you know what that guy is this is a pretty rare bird here on the coast uh, there there are usually a very small number of them that find their way over here in the winter but this is primarily a central valley bird and even there their numbers are declining alarmingly uh, this is the tricolored blackbird with that white bar on his on his wing that shows when the wing is closed when he spreads his wings open he's got red in there too but that white border shows up and then the two birds to the left of that male tricolored are female either red wing or tricolored blackbirds they're very very difficult to tell those two apart so we kind of threw you a curveball there i'd like to to Warren, uh, people who are unfamiliar with blackbirds, that it's very important when you identify a tricolored blackbird that, that you see that that bar is white. You'll see a lot of red winged blackbirds that have yellowish and orangish bars above, uh, above the red. Those are not tricolored even though there's a red and a second color. The only real tricolor is one that has that white stripe and it has to be white. It can't be creamy yellow. So, um, you know, edit, edit yourself. If you think you, you see a trike, make sure it's white. Yeah, and then, like I said, they're rare. So if you report a tricolor blackbird, we will probably ask you questions about it because it is, it is easy to be fooled by uh, winter plumage red wings that have that kind of creamy or buff colored patch. We we get but more trikes on the we get more trikes on the south coast than we do Fort Bragg. Yeah, you have those immense flocks of red wings that bring them in. Yeah. All right. Okay. See. Now we are still in the open country. And in fact, this slide is taken in David's circle. This is the Manchester circle. David, why don't you talk about these guys? This is well. The, there, there are actually three birds in this slide. We're going to focus on the two up front. Those, those two gray birds up front, the light-colored birds up front. Um, there's a pair of them. Um, that's your first clue: is that there are two of them side by side. Um, what are the possibilities, the common possibilities? Um, glaucous wing gull? No, they're not gulls, okay? We'll, we'll take that off the table right away. Um, Eric is on to something. She says they're white-tailed kites. So does Barb, and you are correct. I wanna point out, how would you know those are not two male harriers? 
those would be the other light gray birds uh, hanging out on a fence post sometimes that you could confuse. First of all, I've never seen two male harriers sitting side by side. But more, no, import more importantly, I'm looking at the head and the head is white. And uh, a, a male Northern Harrier won't have a white head. Uh, it'll have more of a, a dark gray head, dark to light gray head. So these, this is a pair of kites, uh, black shoulder, white tailed, uh, black tailed, white shoulder, however you wanna name them. They're our resident kites. And this is typical uh, when they're resting, they're gonna sit on, probably sit on a fence post like that. What's this guy uh, out here in the distance? The bird in the back, uh, we've zoomed up on it and I've got to think, um, even though it gets pixelated pretty quick, I've got to think that's a red tail. Um, my reasoning behind putting the name red tail on that bird is the fact that it's uh, bulky. Uh, even at a distance, it appears to be a fairly large bird. Um, the head is dark. The tail is dark. So um, that for me would rule out a uh, ferruginous hawk, which is another strong possibility in, in this habitat. Also, it's, it's not gonna be a uh, rough winged hawk because again, it has a solid darkish tail. Um, it could possibly be a female harrier. Uh, she would have a dark head, uh, a dark tail. There's that lightness at the base of the tail, which leads some credence to um, female harrier. And I can imagine that the head has uh, the intimation of a facial disc, that that head has some type of a roundish quality to it with a very dark spot in the middle that would be the eye and the base of the bill. So I'm 75% female harrier, 25% red tail hawk. I'm leaning very strongly to a female harrier. And, that, and that's the process I would use to try to put a name on that bird. Yeah, this is one of those things that's hard to do in a photograph. And sometimes even in the field, you just can't quite get it nailed down and you just that's why I spend over $2,000 on a spotting scope. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's a little easier one, uh, or at least it's more diagnostic. This is a, a little tricky view, though, of this particular bird. So the first thing you see when you see a soaring raptor is, you know, is it a red tail? And if not, why not? And in this case, unusually, we can rule out red tail. It does have a dark head and a pale chest, like mm -hmm. red tails do, but it has absolutely no trace of a, a dark bar on the leading edge of the wing. And all red tails have those. So yeah. that's, that's the one thing you can hang your hat off with red tailed hawks. So it's not a red tailed hawk. It's got these kind of long, slender wings, and it's long tailed. So the long wings rule out Cooper's hawk and sharp shin. And the overall shape isn't really consistent with any of the beautios. And then the final thing is what David was talking about in that last bird, this face, this little disc on its face. This is, and the, the black wing tips, like it kind of dipped its wings in a can of paint on the way. Uh, this is the male Northern Harrier beautiful bird, sometimes called the gray ghost, because uh, for whatever reason, we see fewer of them than we do of the females. Yeah. Yeah. Drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking. I like that. <laughs> and, and to be honest, if, if you saw this bird from, if you saw, if this bird tipped and showed its back to you, it would be a much easier identification. You would then know without a doubt that it's a male harrier. You'd right. see the white rump patch and, and the back of the wings would be uh, kind of a smoky, 
pale gray. So this is a tough one. Yeah, yeah, this is a difficult view of a bird that's actually not that hard to identify in the field. Uh, but we thought by this point in the quiz, you're getting so, so we have to make it hard on you. Male Northern Harrier. Uh, somebody asked in the chat if we get very many ferruginous. And uh, I guess the answer is no, we don't get very many, but we do get them consistent, consistently, uh, especially in Manchester. Someone else mentioned Swainson's and unfortunately we don't. Uh, Swainson's tend not to come to our coast. Uh, they're, they're fairly common in the Central Valley in the summertime, but really un, uh, even this summer on the coast, we don't get Swainson's. So yeah. that's, that's a bird we miss. Great bird in, though. In 20 years of birding here and looking at raptors, I've seen two Swainson's hawks. Yeah. Uh, and that's probably one more than most birders. It's, they're really, really rare here on the coast. Yeah. But it's it, actually, it's not a bad guess because of that yeah. dark pattern on the chest. Swainson's got, got a dark chest, but what a Swainson's will have is a white patch on the throat uh, above the dark chest. And so that gives them away. All right, let's get on to an easier bird. This is easy. After the last one, uh, I thought I'd give you a break. But I, I like this slide because it looks like two different species of bird almost, uh, even though these are both, of course, red-tailed hawks. And how do we know that since we can't see their tails? Dark head, pale chest, dark head, pale chest, belly band, belly band. That's all you need for a perched raptor to check it off as a red-tailed hawk. And there's the David rule, which is that, you know, why is it not a red tail? You have to ask yourself, why is it not a red tail? And in this case, we can't come up with any reason why it's not a red-tailed hawk. Why is this not a red tail? No, oh, that's the Jimmy Durante version of the red tail. <laughs> yeah. Look at that enormous beak and, uh, and the long neck. Let me see if I can go back just for a comparison. So these guys, they kind of look like the linebackers in the NFL, right? They have no neck. Their head sits right on their shoulders. Look at this guy. His head is sticking way out there. And then his bill sticks out way out there. Uh, this is also a very large bird, although when it's sitting all by itself, you frequently can't tell how big it is. Uh, you can see those gigantic yellow feet. That helps too. But this is, a, this is a foggy view of an immature bird. And I put this in here and the next couple of slides as well to try to get you guys thinking about these birds because they have become much more common on the coast just in the last, what, three, four years went from being very rare to being almost daily birds. This is an immature bald eagle. Everybody get that? Yeah, bald eagle. So why is it not a golden eagle? Uh, first of all, golden eagles are way more rare on the coast. Almost, they're almost unheard of on the coast. There's maybe a handful of records of golden eagle on the coast. Bald eagles, on the other hand, are, like I said, becoming common, they're resident now. Uh, but look at the bill, that gigantic bill sticks out so far in front of its face uh, that it, it looks disproportionate. And that's the really a key feature for, golden, for bald eagles. Golden eagle is like a gigantic beautio. Their bill is proportionate to the rest of them uh, in the same way that a red-tailed hawk is. Again, look at that bill sticking out and the white under the wing. This is the a flight shot of an immature first year bird, actually, golden, or a, sorry, bald eagle. Uh, see those big splayed out fingers, very large, huge wings with a real deep cord, but above all, their head sticks way out. You can identify bald eagles at a tremendous distance just by the silhouette because their head sticks so far out in front of them more than any other raptor that we have. And then finally, this is the overhead shot. 
which we don't get as much here, but in the valley where you see these birds a lot, this is how you see them. And all that white under the wings. This is the immature, uh, probably a first or second year. Could be a second year bald eagle. At, at the Sacramento Wildlife Refuge in January, we will, weather permitting, we'll very likely see uh, at least one, probably a couple of these um, immature bald eagles. Um, if you're interested in the difference between the bald, immature bald and immature golden, go to your field guides and notice the underwing distribution of the white. In a immature golden eagle, that white is going to be very sequestered in specific areas, whereas in the immature goldens, uh, uh, bald eagles, excuse me, young bald eagles, that white is kind of spread almost randomly across the underside of the wing. So, and I think this is probably a second year because we're starting to see some white in the tail there as well. Yeah, Although I'll yeah. be honest, I we don't see them very often. We're seeing them more on the coast. Yeah, we mostly have adults though. And the adults, yeah. you know, they're, they're, yeah. they're unmistakable. Anybody can identify yeah. an adult bald eagle, so. It's uh, harder to find for them to feed on the coast. Or, and young birds have a tough time surviving because their, their feeding habits aren't very well developed yet. So they're gonna be sticking around where the food is the easiest, i.e. where there's more ducks. Yeah, <laughs> coots. Boy, do they love coots and snow geese. Yeah. So on a golden eagle, you would see uh, soaring overhead like this. And the immature golden eagle would have this uh, bright white band across the tail and a white patch in the outer wing. Uh, these three points of white really give them away. All right. I think we're, we're down almost to the end here. And we're out at the coastal bluffs now. And uh, if you're looking out to see, you turn around, look behind you, and you see this little streaky pale brown sparrow, uh, which is one of, actually, I think this is the, the most abundant North American sparrow. Almost everywhere else, these things are just scattered all over the landscape. But here on the coast, they seem to be confined to the, a little narrow strip right along the coastal bluffs. And of course, I'm talking about a savanna sparrow. with, zoom in a little bit there. Yeah, you can see that a little bit of yellow in front of the eye, pink bill, and that pale sandy color overall. Now, you're also out at the beach and on the driftwood, you see this little guy. This is a trickier bird. I'll let you ponder that. Let me see what do people, yep, everybody got the Savannah Sparrow. Yep, everybody's getting this bird too. That's good, because this is a tricky view yeah. of one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you guys are doing great. If we had video, you'd know it in a second because they're constantly bobbing their tails. This is an American pipit. Uh, they look kind of like a thrush. And uh, in the next slide, you'll see, Catherine calls them the washed out robins. It's, they look like they've been bleached out. They're very thrush-like in the shape, but they bob those tails constantly when they move, and uh, they have the streaky chest. I'm guessing that's a Central Valley bird. It looks like it's on a levee road with a uh, pond in the background. Oh, you're good. That's oh, next year's ne for next year's quiz. Dave's getting ahead of it. Next year we're gonna have you identify not only the bird. And count how many there are, but tell us where the shot was taken and <laughs> what time of day it was. Which camera? Okay. So first you got to identify the bird and then guess at how many of them there are. <laughs> These are a good bird to find on the count uh, because they're so cryptic and hard to see and they tend to be they're not distributed very well across the landscape. There are just a few of them here and there. 
How are you guys doing on your guessing? Yeah, you got him. Yeah, everybody. Hey, we got to make this harder, Tim. Yeah, yeah. Next year's quiz has got to be a lot harder. So here's the so the question is how many? <laughs> and the joke is nobody knows. You can see four, but when you see four snipe, there might be anywhere from four to 30 <laughs> because the rest of them can be so completely hidden that you can't see them at all. But I, I can see four in this picture. Uh, the two here that are out in the open and then two that you can just barely see poking out of the grass over on the left. Nice slide from Roger. These are good okay. birds to find here. And this year we got enough water, we should have snipe. Yep. Ah, okay. Nope. Yeah, my system is, I think my system has been drinking. <laughs> is that Tom Waits song? The piano has been drinking. Yes. yes. Yeah. My, my laptop has been drinking, not me. <laughs> okay. So this is oh, Sarah. Is she nailing it or what? She is hot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you let these guys here. teach the class next year, huh? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Sarah's acing the test. So we got these big long bills on a big dark bird. This is our iconic bird of the Mendocino coast, the black oyster catcher. And then this big white job here, the only go we have with an all white head in winter. The, the adults do anyway, that's an adult Western gull. This one is probably also a Western gull, but it's not an adult. That's why its head is Oh, white. Shannon. Shannon is correct. Is there a turnstone in there? Yes, there is. In that gap between bird, no, from starting from the right, there's a gap between bird five and six. And darned if he didn't spot that turnstone right there. Let's see. Yep, right there. This guy? Oh, move over a little bit more. Now come straight up, Tim. Come up with your with your pointer over to the right. There. Oh, tucked in here. Wow. Yes. Good eye. Wow. That's a tough bird to see. That's good spotting, Shannon. Jiminy. Shannon's, uh, Shannon and Sarah are going to do this <laughs> quiz next year. Yeah. All right. So everybody got, uh, let's see, I forgot to get a count. How many, uh, how many birds would you, would you estimate are in this flock if you didn't just sit and count them on the slide? Y'all are hardcore bird nerds. No kidding. Hello. <laughs> All right, nobody's guessing numbers. And uh, it's a Christmas bird count, so you gotta, you gotta count and you gotta guess because they're probably gonna move before you can count them one by one. Uh, and I'll accept any number between 20 and 30. Yep. Since I have a photograph, I could count them and there was, I counted 24, so. But then I missed the black turnstone, so I could be wrong. Okay, we're... Uh, we took we we probably next year we'll do a lot more gulls and shorebirds because you guys are just nailing all the Tweety birds this year. So we didn't do this is the only gull slide. I I, I had to say that real quick before a bunch of people logged off. <laughs> <laughs> and I mainly included this for the bird on the right. Uh, you can pretty clearly see there's two different species in this slide. And what would you call this one on the right? Hey, not only oh, somebody, yep. Test is still looking. Obviously, Mew. There is no Mew gull anymore. Uh, they went extinct. The, Just uh, like the gray jay. And I wanted to make that point here because if you go looking for Mugol on your eBird checklist, you will not find it and it will drive you crazy. 
they renamed these and this is now called short billed gull which is actually a pretty good name for this gull because that does draw attention to its prominent feature which is its little bitty bill it's gonna have to buy bill. another field guide yep short billed gull and then the other three are california gulls. yeah Californias, they have the yellow legs, pale gray back, dirty head, and that cool looking bill. Californias and shirt bills. <laughs> okay, you know, I almost didn't put this slide in here because I thought it's gonna be way too hard, but you guys are so good. Let's see how good you are here. I'll leave this up and let you work on it for a while. Okay, Shannon is correctly. I spotted the black the black oyster catchers here, and some black turnstones. You, whoop! You guys have to guess how many of them there are. And then there is one gull at the top of the rock. I don't think you can really identify it from this photograph, but just uh, because I took a picture and or I think Catherine did, but I was there. And uh, it is in fact a glaucous winged gull. This was a favorite rock for that bird to always be standing on. Uh, but how many turnstones do you think there are in this picture? And the other question is, is that all there is? Because when you see a flock of turnstones, you gotta zoom in. Let's see if we can zoom in. So we zoom in on this part of the flock and you still have to look really close, but some of these don't look like the others. So check out these guys that are not quite black. They're gray. Uh, come on, I can zoom in. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to let me zoom in. Oh, there we go. Wow. So I zoomed in so you can see, if you can just barely make out, they have yellow legs and feet. Yep. And they are not yellow legs because they're not tall and slender. They're short and squat. And they're a little bit bigger than the black turnstones. These are surf birds. And there's five of them tucked right in there. And it would be super easy to miss those birds when you're guessing at the numbers of the flock of black turnstones, which I should probably let you know that in this slide, I counted 27 black turnstones. There's a little group over here on the left. There's the bigger group down here on the lower right. And then there's a few more right over in here in the upper center as well, a total of 27. And that was the good old days when we had large flocks of black turnstones. Uh, in the last few years, they've for some reason, I just don't see big flocks of them anymore. Okay, everybody got the turnstones and wait, what? Will you show them again? Yeah, okay, I'll show them again. Shannon was questioning whether the rock sandpiper, they don't have yellow feet and yellow legs. No. They're no. and they have longer bills and probably a few other things. So black. Turnstones, these guys that are just black above and white below. And then surf birds, slightly larger with bright yellow legs. When you see them out in the field, uh, their legs are really bright yellow, really pretty. All right, let's move on. For those of you who uh, put money in the pool, it's official. We've reached the over now. Oh, crap. <laughs> I'm going to have to drink. <laughs> well, the good news is we're at the last quiz. All right. Birds in flight. Extra credit. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, uh, and you know, we're having so much trouble with the audio. I don't think we need the audio. You all probably know what these birds are because uh, you're standing on the beach and here they come flying in. They do talk while they do that, but there's really only one option. These, of course, are our black oyster catchers again. And system seems to be trying to freeze up on me. Okay, here we go. This is a tricky slide because their birds are so far away, but they often are. And someone has already spotted the, <laughs> the gotcha bird. So first thing, how many, how many geese have we got here? First thing, I guess, is what are they? They're geese. Which kind of geese are they? There's, you can just make out enough information, I think, to identify these birds. And then a little bit. There you go. Yeah. So these are definitely Canada's, but this little guy, and if you're counting them, you'll run yourself all the way out to the end and notice there's another little guy. So there's two that are like miniature Canada's. Let's see if we can get a little closer look. Here's the center of that flock. And there we go. Look how short the neck is on this guy. Not only is he half the size or less of these big Canada geese, but he's got a little short neck. That's a cackling goose. So it was 20, let's see, how many? Forgot to write down my number there. I think it was uh, 20 Canadas and two cacklers, I think. I love this slide. So you get a long flight of these dark ducks flying over the ocean, low over the water. And so the first thing you can identify these drakes with their white, the white patch on the back of their head and their bright yellow comedy bills. These are surf scoters. But what's going on with this bird? And this bird. That bird. These are two really good birds for this count because these are white winged scoters. The surf scoters are quite common. We have lots and lots of them. So the, the, the trick is to count them. Which is no easy trick when they're all bunched up and they're flying like bats out of hell. Because they really rock it right along. Uh, but there's, you know, between 20 and 30 birds in this flock. And two white wing scoters, very hard birds to find on this count. And the way you, this is usually how you find them. You see a flock of surf scoters and you start going through the flock and look for one with white wing patches. 35, okay, close enough. All right, you with me? Point out one more subtlety between the, these this slide and the previous slide. Where are these birds uh, aerodynamically? They're down near the water. Where were those geese? They were up in the sky. So oftentimes, even at a distance, you can get a real strong clue about what you're looking at, even if it's a far distant bird, simply by where it is in the air column. These will be down low. Brant geese will be down low. Canada geese, cackling geese, white fronted geese are going to be halfway to the moon. Right. Um, so They'll pay attention to where they are on the horizon. The white fronted here would be so high up on a sunny day that you can't even see them. You just hear them. All right. What are you doing? There we go. Speaking of flying high up and, and being able to identify birds by where they are, 
David did a nice uh, video on the YouTube channel uh, all about cormorants. We have three species of cormorants and you can narrow the field down quite a bit just by where you see them flying. When you see them flying high up, they're gonna be these guys because the other two species both tend to fly very low over the water. These are the crookneck cormorant. What's their actual name? These are, of course, double crested cormorants. And the thing you look for is this crooked neck in flight. Both the brants and the pelagic cormorants have much straighter necks when they fly. But again, just the fact they're they're flying way high up is enough to tell you that they're double crested cormorants. Also, where you are matters. Double crested are the only inland cormorants. Both the brants cormorants and pelagic cormorants are found only along the coast. One more bird nerd tip, um, learn from my mistakes. Uh, I once was in, headed home in Fort Bragg. I got about to uh, coast higher and I saw this V flock of birds way up in the sky. I flipped a Yui and chased that flock all the way down to uh, uh, jug handle before I finally got ahead of them, got out with my binoculars, and I looked up in the sky to see what kind of geese they were. They were double crested cormorants. They weren't <laughs> geese at all. And I learned on that day, you can tell with a high flying V of long neck birds, look at the, at the cadence of the wing beat. A Canada goose or some other goose will beat with those massive wings, they beat much slower. Whereas these brant cormorants that look superficially like a goose, dark bird, long neck, they can fly in a V, they have a very rapid cadence to their wing beat. So sometimes even if you can't see the bird, you can pick up on other clues by the way they fly. So um, learn from my mistake. It wasn't a mistake, but it wasn't what I hoped for either. Well, since this is our last slide, I'll add a little shaggy dog story as well. The, um, uh, the, uh, the benefits of looking carefully. We were on a bird walk at the gardens once and looked up and there went a V flock of medium sized dark birds with their necks sticking way out in front. And we all looked up and said, oh, look, there's a flock of double crested cormorants. And for whatever reason, I decided to put my binoculars up and look at them through the binoculars. I don't know why, because you know I've seen millions of double-crested cormorants. But when I looked at them in the binoculars, they suddenly resolved uh, with these great big long curved bills sticking out in front of them, and they were in fact white-faced ibises. Uh, I think maybe the only ones I've ever seen here on the coast. <laughs> so you always got to look. And with that, we have concluded. Woohoo! Great job. I hope everybody got something out of that. Besides drunk. Love the new approach. Thanks for sticking it out, y'all. I, I know the hour gets late. There's just we Tim and I in particular could talk about birds. Well, it's never been determined how long we could talk. Yeah. So thanks for sticking with us. Thank you guys. And uh, if you have questions, you know, you can always send them to audubon at mcn.org. And if you want to join the counts, get in touch with David or me. And uh, if you want to learn more about the birds, go to the YouTube channel. One last thought. When I was a beginning birder, one of the ways that I learned the quickest was by going out on Christmas bird counts with people who really knew their birds because we'd be out there all day and we'd see a lot. So uh, don't be intimidated because you feel like you're not good enough. That's how you do, that's how you get good is by logging hours in the field. So come join us. All right, everybody, if you have, uh, if you don't have any questions, if you have a question, pop it up on the chat. And if not, we will see you out there in the field 
and we'll be back with you in January for the program. I believe that will be our first in-person program. If all goes well, we will be back in the Casper Community Center for the January program. Looking forward to that. Thanks everybody and have a great evening. Thanks, Tim.